When you lose focus, you lose the ability to achieve your goals. And unfortunately, we live in a world of endless distractions. Yet by understanding the neuroscience of attention, you can train your brain to focus on what matters. Okay, say you're writing a report for work. You're a few paragraphs in when you glance over at your phone and you remember you're expecting an important email from a colleague. So you open your email app and check for it. No message yet, but you did receive a newsletter from an investment website. You read the email and follow the link to the website, and soon you find yourself scrolling through market data without any real intention of buying or selling. An hour later, you remember the report and realize you've only managed to type out half a page. After bargaining with yourself to look at just one more graph, you finally put the phone down and get back to writing. What just happened? Your initial intention was definitely not to scroll mindlessly for an hour, yet for some reason, that's what you did. It took you a while to notice this lapse in attention and even longer to return to your objective. The question you might ask yourself is why the brain gets distracted, but the more fundamental question is why the brain is able to focus in the first place. Okay, wherever you happen to be right now, your senses are taking in an enormous amount of information. It's just way too much to process all at once. Somehow, your brain needs to select what's important for further processing and discard or discount everything else. That's what attention is for. Okay, so say you're back at your desk. Having finally finished that report, you're now responding to emails on your phone. All around you, people are walking, talking, working, and there are countless things you could look at. Much of this visual information is entering your eyes, yet somehow you're able to ignore everything except that tiny screen. Your brain accomplishes this by amplifying the neural activity that corresponds to your phone, while at the same time tamping down the activity corresponding to everything else in your visual field. But how does it do that? Now, the brain's frontal cortex, specifically the dorsal prefrontal areas, and parietal cortex, specifically the intraparietal sulcus and superior parietal lobule, seem to be crucial for this ability to focus on one area of the visual field at the expense of all others. Together, these areas are called the dorsal attention network. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'll call it the focus network. The focus network sends a signal to the part of the brain responsible for visual perception, called the visual cortex, and it commands it to selectively process only the area of your visual field corresponding to your phone. Now think of your visual cortex as a map of your visual field. When you attend to a particular location, the neurons in that area of the map increase their activity. But just as you're typing out an email, your coworker Tom walks up to your desk, smiling and waving as he asks for a minute of your time. Somehow this change in your visual field just snatches your gaze away from the phone and toward Tom's face. In the brain, this happens because novel and important stimuli like the sudden arrival of Tom activates a different set of brain regions and forcefully shifts attention to the unexpected change in the environment. This includes areas like the ventral frontal cortex and temporal parietal junction. Together, these brain regions are called the ventral attention network, but in this video, I'll refer to it as the distraction network. Now, what's important to remember is that the focus network is involved in top-down attention, like the kind of goal-directed attention that keeps us on task. On the other hand, the distraction network is involved in bottom-up attention, also known as stimulus-driven attention. It's what pulls our mind away from the task at hand when something unexpected happens around us. After your discussion with Tom, you decide to take a break from emails and work instead on writing a few of the company's social media posts. As you stare at the monitor, typing out intriguing hooks and sentences, your gaze shifts every now and then down to your keyboard or to your secondary monitor or out the window. In this case, you're not really distracted. In fact, you're completely focused on the task. It's just that your visual attention briefly relaxes and slightly shifts every few moments. This may be due to a natural cycle that occurs in your brain a few times every second. According to the neuroscientists Ian Feeblecorn and Sabine Kastner, the attention network exhibits a rhythmic cycling between periods of enhanced and diminished perceptual sensitivity, with the cycle completing roughly four to six times per second, or about once every 250 milliseconds. They propose that during the first half of the, the enhanced phase of the cycle, the brain is sampling a behaviorally relevant location, and therefore perception is enhanced at that location. Then during the second half, the diminished phase of the cycle, the brain is getting ready to shift attention to a new location, and so perception is less sensitive. 
This is a temporary dip in focus, which increases the chances of you noticing something unexpected, like that notification of a text appearing on your phone. You see a message from your friend asking if you want to take a hike later. You consider the question and begin to type your response. Now, realizing just how much time you've wasted on distractions, you get a little frustrated with yourself and begin to wonder whether you can somehow enhance your focus. Okay, in my view, there are four key steps to developing greater focus. These are intention, awareness, willful shifting, and wandering. Let's tackle each of these. First, intention. One of the most powerful and underrated things you can do to improve your ability to focus is to consciously set the intention to stay on task and then set up your environment to facilitate that. Every morning, I do some kind of exercise. While I'm hiking or lifting weights or running, I mentally set an intention to eliminate possible distractions and stay focused throughout my day. I also write out my to-do list for all the work activities I'm going to do a day in advance, which clarifies exactly what I need to be doing and when. Now, one reason this works may have to do with how the brain sets goals. The focus network is closely associated with another network called the frontoparietal control system, which allows us to set and follow through on plans of action. This system is crucial for controlling our behavior and resisting distractions. So by writing down what you need to do in advance and setting a conscious intention to stay completely focused on it, you're loading a goal into the frontoparietal control system and setting yourself up for success. Also, by removing distractions, setting your phone to do not disturb, and maybe even telling your coworkers that you'll be unavailable for a little while, you reduce the number of possible distractors and thereby make it easier to stay focused. Yet, if you're working on something that isn't very fun or interesting, no matter how much you intend to stay focused and no matter how distraction-free your environment, your brain will always find a way to shift attention to something else. The key to getting back on track is to become aware of this, this unintentional shift of attention as quickly as possible. This requires awareness of awareness, or what is called meta-awareness. Mindfulness and other forms of meditation are powerful tools for enhancing meta-awareness. Now, mindfulness meditation is extremely simple. You just close your eyes and notice what's happening in your sensory experience and pull yourself back every time you get lost in a thought, which is surprisingly often. The key, however, is to bring mindfulness into your day-to-day -day life. You need to practice becoming aware of when your mind inadvertently orients toward your phone or some other source of distraction. If you practice this skill, you will have a much easier time employing the third step in enhancing attention, which is willful shifting. This is where the rubber meets the road. When you become aware that you've gotten distracted, you have a simple choice. You can allow yourself to waste more time or disengage from the distractor and come back to what you know you should be doing. This can be surprisingly hard. When I find that I've gotten distracted, I sometimes notice that I start bargaining with myself, like saying things like, oh, I'll get back to work at the five minute mark. Okay, definitely the 10 minute mark. Okay, I will certainly get back to work at the top of the hour. And if I continue down this path, pretty soon I'll have wasted the entire hour. What I found helpful is to stop this bargaining as soon as it gets started. It's incredibly easy to convince ourselves that we need just one more minute and then another and then another of something that we really don't need at all. I found that continually challenging myself to make the painful decision, whether it's exiting the web page or closing the app, makes that decision easier in the future. The neural pathways of the focus network and frontoparietal control system will get stronger and more efficient, and you'll gradually gain a greater and greater ability to resist distraction and stay on task. Combining these first three steps will allow you to focus for longer periods of time with greater intensity. Yet the truth is that the brain simply can't stay focused all the time. It needs to go into a kind of recovery mode in order to avoid burnout and exhaustion. This is where the final step comes in. If you've ever trained for a marathon, you know that it would be counterproductive to run every day all the time without rest. So by the time you got to the race, your body would be so badly damaged, you'd probably be unable to run at all. The same is true with focus. It's extremely rare for anybody to be able to focus undistracted on a single task for more than a few hours, if that. And even if you do manage to force yourself to keep going, you'll probably find that your productivity has reached a point of diminishing returns. 
One reason for this has to do with a drop in dopamine levels, which is associated with a drop in motivation. But it's also because the networks of the brain have a harder time communicating with each other efficiently after you've been working on a task for a long time. Now, a lot of people take breaks, but the problem is that they take low quality breaks that don't rejuvenate their attention as strongly as they could. So when we take like a bathroom break, many of us instinctively reach for our phones and start scrolling mindlessly. The problem with this is that your brain is still activating the focus network when you're watching, you know, TikTok or YouTube shorts. The point is to switch off focused attention, not direct it at something else. Try to leave your phone in your pocket and just take a walk, you know, without listening to a podcast or doing anything else that requires focused attention. Now, taking this kind of high quality break will require self-discipline, but taking focus more seriously will make you not only more productive and efficient, but also much happier. One thing to keep in mind is that psychologists have found that we generally report being happier when we're focused on something. But on a deeper level, human beings thrive on flow. Flow is a mental state in which we're totally absorbed in what we're doing. Time seems to evaporate and every action flows seamlessly into the next. In general, people who report having more flow in their lives are also happier in day-to-day -day life. Flow is most likely to arise when the thing we're doing is challenging, but still within our skill level. When we have clear moment-to-moment -moment feedback on our performance and when we enjoy the task itself at least a little bit. Now, flow is a beautiful experience and it's available to everyone, but some people can access it more easily than others. The great thing is that you can increase the odds of entering a flow state by improving your attention. Beyond flow, training attention has enormous benefits for our day-to-day -day lives. When you can be undistracted and engage more fully in conversations with the people you love, you can connect on a deeper and more intimate level. Even when you're just watching a movie or reading a novel, a greater ability to focus will make that experience much more absorbing and fun. Yet one of the biggest impediments to engaging more fully with life is a distraction that comes not from our phones or the people around us, but from within, our emotions. We are emotional creatures and emotions are much more important than we sometimes think. In a profound way, they seem to define the quality of our lives. Personally, I know that learning to better regulate my emotions has vastly improved my attention because it's removed a major distractor from my life. But this raises a lot of questions, right? What are emotions? Why are they so powerful? And how can we learn to control them? You can find the answers to all those questions in this video right here.